Hi, and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim. This is Dr. K, and well, we're continuing our talk about uh, the signing of numbered treaties in the West. Why is it uh, that the government negotiated by treaty? Okay, so we talked about why native people negotiated by treaty. The government really had no choice. It's actually bound by an earlier piece of legislation called the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and that's at the period when Canada is turned over from the French to the to the British. And this uh, this is also a result of Pontiac's rising, which happens in that period. So it set aside all the land west of Montreal for native people. And if the government wanted that land, it had to purchase it at a meeting held in public with all parties present. So this is a very interesting thing. It's still the subject of court cases today because it, it kind of indicates, you would think, that if you have to buy something from somebody, then it doesn't belong to you in the first mm. place and it maybe belongs to them. But the British yeah. don't see it that way at all. They're like, yeah, we have to, you know, we have to buy that land, but we're really, we're only buying, uh, you know, it's our land anyway, and we're buying the Indian title over the land, the like, the right to usage of land. So it's, it's a really kind of complicated subject even to this very day. Uh, so, of course, uh, most of the land west of Montreal or of Ontario had been held by the Hudson Bay Company, so the government really doesn't have to do anything until it buys out the Hudson Bay Company lease. And in fact, the government only wants, there's no intention of signing all the treaties out to the Rockies at all because it knows it's going to cost it some money. So it only wants to sign treaties when it's absolutely necessary, like, for instance, for the railway. So mm -hmm. it actually gets pushed into signing more treaties faster than it's expecting to. For the Blackfoot in particular, one of the missionaries there, Father Constantine Scullin, he acts, the Blackfoot are like, oh, we've heard that the, the you know all the people kind of to the east of us, the Cree, that they've all signed treaties so we don't want to be left out can you open negotiations or open a dialogue or something with the government so uh, he does this for them so the the government has to sign and uh, i mean i suppose they don't, wouldn't have had to sign by treaty but it just seems like the normal way that you'd actually be able to make yourself understood so it's bound by the royal proclamation um it wants settlement to be orderly it doesn't want to have a lawless frontier We've already seen the Cypress Hills Massacre mm -hmm. right in the middle of all this. Uh, it wants to keep its Western expansion costs as low as possible. Of course, we don't have an army, so we <laughs> don't uh, you know, want to avoid, um, again, an Indian war. And it was worried about the Blackfoot in particular because they were mounted and warlike and thought, you know, if they didn't want to sign, this would be problematic. And that's why the Treaty 7... Um, a treaty with the, the Blackfoot is actually different from the other ones and the government negotiated in a slightly different way by never mentioning the sale of land, just talking about this being a peace treaty, which hmm. of course you'd think would lead to some understand misunderstandings. Uh, it also of course wants to make sure that there's no reason for the Americans to expand into um, the West. Uh, into our west and in some cases as I just mentioned it was responding to native requests for treaty making so you know it's, it's got all of that uh, so it has some you know really specific reasons mostly just to do with cost saving and not having a, a lawless frontier mm -hmm. and being bound by the Royal Proclamation of 1763 okay can't well, avoid it what was the outcome of, of these treaty signings oh how many years do you have? Um, <laughs> it doesn't work out all that well. There's lots of misunderstandings, but at the same time, um, in our infinite wisdom as, as Canadians and uh, with historians relying until very recently not on the oral histories of people at all, but on the written record, it's always seemed to Canadians that it was perfectly understandable that native people must have known what they were signing or they <laughs> wouldn't have signed it, uh, and and that, you know, they're, they're just... Um, that, you know, that they're in the wrong, that, that we did the right thing. So it's very interesting because, of course, now we have both sides of the story, not just the one. Uh, first of all, you're dealing with two different concepts of property in the West and especially, you know, the Britain. Uh, we've long, for a long, long time, had this concept of private property. We know exactly what that means. And, and when people, uh, even after the American Revolution, came up into what would one day become Ontario, you get freehold tenure. They buy the land, it's yours. You know, there's no questions and then on the other hand, for native people, you have the concept of communal property. You know, the creators made this land, put it there for us to share, and we can't 
divide it up and sell it off to people. You know, you'd have traditional hunting territories, or you'd have a traditional territory that belonged to your group, and then there'd be another group on the other side of that territory. But beyond that, not really an understanding of the concept of I'm going to sell you the history hut and, and <laughs> it will be yours forevermore. Uh, wouldn't be like that at all. Uh, so you, you have that. And there's also trouble because, of course, they used Métis interpreters. The Métis interpreters come in for quite a bit of stick because they didn't necessarily have a command of the individual native languages <laughs> that they, that, you know, that, that I think Jerry Potts was supposed to be dealing with the Stony Nakoda and didn't, um, couldn't understand Stony or not very much of it. So how do you interpret a 17 page document to people when you don't even speak their language um, and it's not clear as well what the Métis interpreter said about the land sale and that's because they did understand the concept of private property and you're being hired by the government to interpret for people and if they get a good result this will be a positive thing so of course you don't know whether they're you know, saying, yeah. like couching it in all sorts of other terms. They they used kinship analogies a lot. You know, the queen is your mother and she wants you to da 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 da, da you know. So it's not really clear what was actually said mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, not clear on our side what was actually said, just what we wrote down after the fact. Um, different interpretations of the treaty, one seeing it as a, a, a living bond, the annual fur trading thing and then the other side the the british side going okay sign a treaty we usually sign treaties with other countries to end a war that's it you sign the treaty it's all over so a kind of one of on the one hand uh, versus uh the the sense that if things change there'll be changes to the treaty mm -hmm. not that it's cast in stone uh the problem of written culture versus oral culture that's another another big issue um people that come from an oral culture can remember things in great detail but they often remember it in a different sort of way whereas we can just write everything down and completely forget about it and we just yeah. write it down and go oh I've got that you know and it's only Your students exam probably time don't think yeah. it's, about that. Yeah. it's only exam time you have to go back and, and read through this stuff but normally you just kind of keep writing keep writing and it's all out of your head um, the belief by the one side that it had bought the land that would be that would be our side uh, Canadian side and by the other that they had granted the rights of, of, of using the land they had said well, it's okay you know we'll keep the peace mm -hmm. if people come out here we'll keep the peace um, and, and th this is one of the questions um, was the sale of land actually raised as as a point of order at the <laughs> meetings or not? And in the case of uh, Treaty 7, it may well not have been raised as an issue. It's not like we're taking Banff and all of this lovely area from you and it will be ours now. Um, not discussed at all. So huge misunderstandings. Uh, this is a, a, a quote from a Cree elder in 1884. He said, the government comes and tells the Indians we're not coming to buy your land. We come to borrow the country to keep it for you. I want my children to live here at peace with you. The Indians understood the country is only borrowed, not bought. And then in the 1970s, uh, there was a, a really good report, the TAR report, Treaty Aboriginal Rights Research Report. It was an oral history project. And so they went back and they talked to um, uh, Treaty 6 elders uh, and asked them what they knew about the treaty, you know, through their oral history. And um, the elders for Treaty 6 said that uh, it was an agreement to let white people use the land for farming, but only to planting depth. The Treaty, El uh, treaty 7 elders, the, the Blackfoot, said that the sale or borrowing of land had not been mentioned and that the Indians in return for keeping the peace would be protected by the Queen and could move about freely and they could choose their reserves and it turns out that the elders were actually right because that's what they were told but that isn't what comes back in the written treaty that everybody signs. Hmm. Um, so there's a book by uh, Diane Miele called The Elders Say and there's all sorts of accounts of uh, the treaty period and this is just uh, a guy called Yellowhorn is Pagan he said the Northwest Mounted Police and men came and said they were sent to keep the peace. That was uh, This was in 1875, but Bullhead wouldn't sign, so McLeod asked for shelter through the winter, stayed on in 1876, and then word came in 1877 that the treaty was coming and Crowfoot was chosen to represent them all. He put his hand on the pen that put his X mark on the treaty. No other writing took place. We were promised a new life, cattle, medicine and education. Uh, and he also said that he never knew a Métis to speak good Blackfoot. So there you go. Uh, so all sorts of accounts like that. And of course, the, the written texts show or the written text shows um, the government view. It's quite clear that uh, the that the Indians have been asked to and have agreed to um, surrender their lands to the Queen. 
that they can still hunt throughout their territory, which isn't going to be the case at all. Uh, just uh, it actually says at some point in the future, uh, settlers may come here and we want you to kind of leave them alone. Uh-huh. Uh, they would get one square mile per f- of land per family with equipment and cattle. They would get $12 a head when they signed in $5 a year forever. And down at Hobima, they still hand out the $5 in September. Oh. Yeah, they can still get it. Uh, and the government would spend about $2,000 a year on ammunition, and there'd be salaries for teachers on the reserves. And then anyone that wasn't there at Blackfoot Crossing for the, the signing of Treaty 7 uh, in the add ons, it says, We, the Indians, we Indians understand. Uh, what we have done we surrender our land and we will accept payment benefits and the reserves promised now that's all well and fine except that uh, the native people that the government was dealing with couldn't read or write in english so it's all dependent on the speaking part and for the for the canadians the speaking part wasn't the important part they knew they were going to have to sit through like three days of speeches and stuff and they're like okay you know until we get to the bit where we get to agree on everything so that part wasn't important for them but that was the key part for for native people Mm -hmm. so just really you know it's become really clear in the last few decades that the written texts don't really reflect the verbal promises uh, that were made during the negotiations and the elders insisted that what was actually said was just as important as what was written down uh, if not more important and in some cases the commissioners did uh, admit after the fact um, that they hadn't especially in the case of the Blackfoot that they hadn't mentioned land sale at all they'd framed it as a peace negotiation you stay at peace with us we'll you know we'll help you out in this this horrible this horrible time that you're having so you can of course get these treaties online that's a copy of uh, treaty treaty seven and just to give you an idea because you know I've said that okay people didn't read and write English and you're thinking well you know they could probably still understand what was going on in the treaty so knowing that that it, it's just about peace and it's not about land sale just let me just let me read this part to you this is from the articles of the treaty uh, the very bottom of the the first page it says um, uh, the Blackfoot, Blood, Pagan, Sarsi, Stoney, and other Indians inhabiting the district hereafter, more fully described and defined, do hereby, and listen to these words, cede, release, surrender, and yield up to the Government of Canada for Her Majesty the Queen and her successors forever all their rights, titles, and privileges whatsoever to the lands included within the following limits. <laughs> and then it gives you, you know, the actual the actual geographic markers, the international boundary to Cypress Hills, and west along there to the, the central range of the Rock, Keys and then northwest up. So, I mean, it just gives you the exact location of the land that they haven't bought. Wow. You know, it's just crazy. Um, and then it says, Her Majesty the Queen agrees with her Indians that they shall have the right to pursue their vocation of hunting throughout the track surrender as heretofore described, uh, subject to such regulations as may from time to time be made you know, maybe settlement in the future, uh, that reserves shall be assigned to them of sufficient area to allow one square mile for each family of five persons and um, that uh, it says, you know, where they can have their reserves in a, in a huge kind of dimension of the, uh, of the territory. So, um, and then it says, you know, that make the present of $12 each, $5 every year forever, 2000 for ammo and... Uh, the teacher's salaries and then supplies and everybody was supposed to get two cows per family and a bull per band and then uh, they also says that they have to conduct and behave themselves as good and loyal subjects of her majesty the queen and i know that you probably can't see this because i never do this properly but uh, there's all the names of all the chiefs are there and there's an x beside them there's a little x beside their their names so and and crowfoot didn't even X, he just touched the pen that X'd for him. Hmm. So, um, quite, quite interesting. Um, so, we know that um, the government offered uh, these annuities and reserves at first, in, especially in treaties one to three, so the, the ones in kind of Manitoba, the Manitoba area. Uh, but the the actual people that they were negotiating with insisted on some education, some agricultural assistance, some food, and some medical help. So, those things are added in. And then they become the kind of standard as they go across the prairies. Uh, We also know, as I said before, that the government only wanted to make treaty uh, when absolutely necessary. But the Cree in particular pushed the government to move faster. Like, if you want your Mm -hmm. train to go through here, then you're going to have to, uh, you know, deal with us. Um, And we we know as well, uh, as I said before, that the the government never really recognized the importance of the oral ceremony, which could take like three or four days. um, When Crowfoot comes to uh, Blackfoot Crossing with, with all of his 
these men, uh, they're offered all sorts of food and stuff, and they're like, no, we're not taking anything until we've actually made the deal, you know, so kind of like, so they all had to wait for a few days. Uh, we know as well that the treaties, by the time you get to Treaty 6, in our area, um, and, or Treaty 4 in Saskatchewan with the Cree, that the uh, the treaties were already written up. Because if you look at Treaty 6, Star Blanket um, demanded three extra things, a famine clause, a medicine chest, and uh, assistance for farming for the, the first three years, and they all had to be added on to the now mm. kind of standard, uh, standard treaty. So the outcome of the treaty saying the treaty said that they could choose the reserves, but this wasn't actually allowed. And there are some good examples of this. Um, when we get to the 1885 rebellion, Big Bear hadn't been allowed to take his reserve up beside Poundmaker. There were quite a few of them. They thought, well, we'd have all the reserves right beside one another. And the government was like, oh, I don't think so, because if it was an Indian war, you'd all be close to each other mm -hmm. and you'd be able to, you know, really kind of mount um, a, a good attack. So uh, the um, the Indian commissioner and then later Lieutenant Governor Ed, uh, Edgar Judney said no. Um, they were supposed to have emergency rations allowed, but they weren't given them until they had chosen their reserves and settled their reserves. And uh, again, in the case of um, Big Bear, he wanted his reserves in the southern part of what would be Saskatchewan. And the uh, member of the train line was changed from going north to going south. So they wanted them out of there. So they, they, they closed down the place that they get emergency rations from at Fort Walsh, I think, and moved them up to the Battlefords to the Battleford mm. area today. So they hadn't been allowed to choose their, their own reserve. They weren't given emergency rations despite the famine uh, clause in Treaty 6. And of course, within a decade, the government decided that they didn't want them all over the place because you didn't know where they were. So they uh, curbed their uh, their freedom of movement by establishing a thing called the pass system. Not really tested in law, I don't believe, but uh, people were told that it was a criminal offence to leave the reserve without a piece of paper, the pass given to them by the Indian commissioner and they would go to great lengths to make sure that people had these passes uh, and it's kind of ludicrous at times. Uh, then also because Canada was affected by the world recession, we talked about this the other day from 1874 on, uh, much of the stock, the tools, the seed, the things that people had been promised, the government tried to find cheaper ways of providing them. So not such good cattle as you're probably supposed to get. The first year after I think Treaty 6 was signed, this, the uh, the seed went to Winnipeg, but then it stayed there and it didn't, didn't make its way out west. So they really mm -hmm. get stiffed for... Uh, a lot of those things and then the government uh, was supposed to hand out all sorts of tools you got so many owls and um, you know hatchets and whatever uh, and it started branding them id for indian department to let them know that they didn't really wasn't really theirs at all you know mm -hmm. they couldn't get it uh, and the government seemed to have wanted to turn native people into farmers because otherwise it would cost too much to pay out the the treaty obligations. So they were like, well, you know, these people will become a, a burden on the public purse. So if we can get them out and working and be self-sufficient, that will be great. Um, they thought that a little hard work, which tells you a lot about attitudes, a little hard work would make, you know, real strong Canadians mm -hmm. out of them. So they saw um, farming as a kind of moral lesson. And uh, they also believed in a thing called the stages of development theory. It's from the Enlightenment. Um, and, it, and they believed that people had to go through four stages to get, you know, to get to, you couldn't skip a stage. So they were like, oh, you can't go from pastoralist to farming. You have to go through the, the hunting and gathering stage. And you can't go from the hunting and gathering stage to commercial farming. You have to go through this kind of subsistence level thing. So just really strange ideas and ideas of social Darwinism as well. You know, the, the survival of the fittest and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, um, so they're actually, the, although they're given a square mile of land per family, they're actually kind of told to just farm like two acres of land and they give them root crops to grow because it'll be really hard and you have to weed them all the time. So you've <laughs> got this really strange thing happening where you'll have native people working with the poorest of tools, the worst of stock, the poorest of seed. They're not told to, they're not kind of helped to farm large scale at all because if settlers do come to the West, you don't want anybody to be in competition with them and these people are all farming together and so, you know, they could really do some damage to mm -hmm. the, the new immigrants. So everything that could act or work against them does. Um, so, you know, uh, Sarah Carter in her wonderful book, Lost Harvest, talks about them um, in, uh, talks about Saskatchewan and Manitoba, um, that 
that even when people were successful, so you have some Cree who become really successful farmers, and then they're not allowed to sell their crops off the reserve. <laughs> so what is the point of the whole exercise? So you make people work hard, but you don't let them reap any benefits. And of course, they own land communally, so you can't get credit for anything either. Yeah. And the, you have to have a pass to get either your, your body or your, your crops uh, off the reserve. So really difficult for people. And then um, the, another thing was that reserve land wasn't supposed to be sold off without the consent of the band. And the government decided to sell some of it anyway, just to cover the costs of the treaties, because I suppose this is self-evident, but with that social Darwinism thing, they believed that gradually native people would just kind of weaken and die off. And the strongest amongst them would already have transitioned to Canadian life and they become Canadians. And so mm -hmm. at some point in the near future, it wouldn't cost them much at all because there wouldn't be any treaties. Reserves, yeah. native people. But of course, that that then the, the numbers do actually go down for a long time, but then they revive again at the, just after the turn of the century. So, um, after 1911, about 50 percent of all reserve land was sold off. And uh, the way they they sweetened the pie was they they said to bands, I think bands used to get 10 percent of the money from the land sale, and then the rest went into trust for them. And I think uh, it was changed to you could get 50 percent. So we're like, oh, what are you doing? You know, living here in abject poverty, sell us that land, and you, we'll give you. 50% of the cut and then you can mm. buy whatever you want so really challenging times I suppose uh, so in Saskatchewan 270,000 out of 520,000 acres of land was sold reserve land was sold off by 1928 so uh, they're not really following the even the treaties if you assume that the treaties were even fair to begin with they're not mm -hmm. even living up to the promises in the in the treaties well, that's, that's, that's all very interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll continue the treaty outcomes in part four of this episode. Okay.